old house had been ransacked and deserted, the provisions away, with everything of value to the insurgents. Thinking that we should fare better at the schoolhouse, we bent our steps in that direction. The night was dark and rainy, and after tramping for an hour and a half at least, we came to the schoolhouse. And this was about two o'clock in the morning. The schoolhouse was packed with things moved there by the party the previous day. But we searched in vain after lighting a match for food, our great necessity, or for our young companions in the struggle. Thinking it unsafe to remain in the schoolhouse for fear of oversleeping ourselves, we climbed up the mountain in the rear of it to lie down until daylight. It was after sunrise sometime when we awoke in the morning. The first sound we heard was shooting at the ferry. Hazlett thought it must be Owen Brown and his men trying to force their way into the town as they had been informed a number of us had been taken prisoners. So we started down along the ridge to join them. And when we got inside of the ferry, we saw the troops firing across the river to the Maryland side with considerable spirit. And looking closely, we saw, to our surprise, that they were firing upon a few of the colored men who had been armed the day before by our men at the Kennedy farm and stationed down at the schoolhouse by C.P. Tidd. They were in the bushes on the edge of the mountains dodging about occasionally exposing themselves to the enemy. The troops crossed the bridge in pursuit of them, but they retreated in different directions. Being further in the mountains and more secure, we could see without personal harm befalling us. We concluded to make our escape north. We started at once and wended our way along until dark. So hungry we were that we sought out a cornfield under the cover of night, gathered some of the ears which, by the way, were pretty well hardened, carried them into the mountains, our fortunate resource, and having matches, struck fire and roasted and feasted. During our perilous and fatiguing journey to Pennsylvania and for some time after crossing the line, our food was only corn roasted in the ear, often difficult to get without risk, and seldom eaten but at long intervals. And as a result of this poor diet and the hard journey, we became nearly famished and very much reduced in bodily strength. Poor Hazlett could not bear the privations as I could. He was less inured to physical exertion and was of rather slight form, though inclined to be tall. And with his feet blistered and sore, he held out as long as he could, but at last gave out, completely broken down, 10 miles below Chambersburg. He declared it was impossible for him to go further and begged me to go on as we should be more in danger if seen together in the vicinity of the towns. He said after resting that night he would throw away his rifle and go to Chambersburg in the stage next morning where we agreed Eat again. That poor young man's face was wet with tears when we parted. I was loath to leave him as we both knew that danger was more imminent than when in the mountains around Harper's Ferry. At the latter place, the ignorant slaveholding aristocracy were unacquainted with the topography of their own grand hills. In Pennsylvania, the cupidity of the pro slavery classes would induce them to seize a stranger on suspicion 
or go hunting for our party. So tempting to them is the bribe offered by the slave power. Their debasement in that respect was another reason why we felt the importance of traveling at night. After leaving young Hazlett, I traveled on as fast as my disabled condition would admit of and got into Chambersburg about two hours after midnight. 